believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is the Word of God and has the right to command my belief and action. I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Hello, Westside Family Church here in the North Sanctuary. How are you? A shout out to those in the South Sanctuary. Let's give it up for the South Sanctuary folks. I was just over there a second ago, and they are strong and ready to go. How about our, our West Side Cordillera San Antonio group? How about that? Let's give it up for those folks. Come on. You got to go. Let's do a yeehaw for them. And uh, let's, let's not forget our online people. I mean, literally all over the world. Let's give it up for our online people. Come on. And let's not forget, joining us in this journey is Westside Family Church Leavenworth, a Colonial Presbyterian, as well as Harvest Ridge Church. This is a really awesome thing. We are expecting God to show up in a mighty, mighty way. Today, if you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you as our guest. Uh, we are here uh, launching a brand new series called Believe. And I want to see how many people, if you raise up either your Bible or your Believe book overhead, I want to make sure we have at least of some people here that have those with you. You're going to need this every single step of the way, not only the Believe book, but the Believe study guide, because um, I'm going to be referring to it, not putting it on the the screen and also your belief study guide has a place at the end of the chapter called the journal where you can take notes now we also have the notes in your program and it's perforated so I recommend you take notes from the program and then tear it out and stick it in your belief journal at the end of the entire 30 weeks you're gonna have a have chronicled your journey in what you believe and why it matters so let me ask you a question are you ready to get started. I mean, are you seriously ready to get started? Because we got some heavy lifting to do in the word of God. This is not for the faint of heart. Let's pray and we'll get to work. God, thank you so much for the privilege of being in this place. And for all the people that are watching online, we thank you for them. And we just now enter this with great anticipation as we start right where we need to start. And that is understanding who you are. We thank you so much. And all of God's people shouted. Amen. A burst of thunder sent a three-year-old girl flying into her parents' bedroom. Mommy, I'm scared. I'm scared. The mother, half awake and half unconscious, said, Sweetie, go back to bed. God will be with you. The small little figure stood in the doorway for a second and then responded, Mommy, I'll stay in here with daddy and you go in there and sleep with God. <laughs> I love that. I love that story. You know, uh, sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our arms around God, isn't it? Even the whole concept of who God is. I mean, it's just, just so overwhelming at times. It just takes big brain thinking to wrap your mind around God, right? Did you know that an ostrich's eye is bigger than its brain? Sometimes I feel like an ostrich. But A.W. Tozier, author and theologian, wrote this. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Why? Because this mindset, or lack thereof, will turn around and drive all that we are and all that we do. So we're gonna start off by laying down the key question, the key question that we're asking and answering. You must start with the right one, and if you're taking notes, observe, the key question is not, is there a God? This is not the key question. The truth is, in human history, even to this day, Statistically, there's not that many people 
who declare they don't believe in God. You may think that to be surprising, but with all of the effort that has been done in the United States to pull God out of the schools, to take out the Ten Commandments in public places, all that has been done to wipe God out of the United States of America, at the end of the day, the stats show us that only 2% of the entire population in America is willing to declare there is no God. 2.4% to be exact. The intellectuals have thrown at us all that they have, the best of what they had, and the population is simply saying, we are not convinced. As a matter of fact, if you do the research on atheism within the world, the percentage even in the world is somewhere between two and eight percent. Essentially, the question, is there a God, is a non-starter. In Texas, we would say, that dog won't hunt. (laughs) Or we might say, if the horse is dead, dismount. (laughs) Psalm chapter 19, you'll get that in a second. In Psalm chapter, uh, in in, in the book of Psalms chapter 19, uh, the scripture says, uh, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. If you look on page 16 of your Believe book or Psalm chapter 19, you will see that the scripture tells us that if you want to know if there is a God, all you have to do is look up. Essentially, creation gives us all of the facts that we need to declare that there is a God. If you're on page 16 and you see Psalm 19, the passage of scripture right below it is Romans chapter one and verse 20. Paul repeats the same thing that Psalm 19 does, but he goes a step further and says that the evidence that has been provided to every human who has ever lived because of creation means that when All of us stand before God at the end of the day. We will be without excuse. You say, well, I've never heard. The God that you will face will say, I provided all the evidence that you needed, even without the presence of a Bible, to declare that I existed. I I had a neighbor in Texas who is an astrophysicist. His full-time job, get this, is to discover or to study life on other planets. Can you imagine waking up tomorrow and that being your assignment? Like, where does one start, you know? Hmm. He said to me, Randy, the reality is, is that I study the big picture. I look up and study the universes. My daughter is into genetics. She studies the small the micro level. I look at the macro, she looks at the micro level, and we're both scientists. And we will tell you honestly that whether you look at the macro level or the deepest level inside of all that God has created, there is undeniable proof that God exists. Science, he says, as long, along with other scientists, science does not disprove God, but day by day is helping us to actually understand God better. So I say to my scientist friends who don't yet believe there is a God, keep looking, keep studying, you're getting closer and closer, and you will discover. My buddy, the astrophysicist, Dr. Waite, said, but Randy, keep in mind, that a lot of scientists hide behind their intellect. In reality, they don't want to discover there is a God. Because if there is a God, that changes everything. And they're no longer the God of their life. And they have to submit to this God. So it's not about intelligence. It's ultimately about the heart. Wow. Interesting. The Bible opens up with this phrase, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God. What does that mean? It means that before any of humanity ever stepped onto the scene, God already existed. Study the Bible numerous times, as you might imagine, from cover to cover, from cover to the maps, if you will, and I have concluded that God does not feel compelled 
to prove his existence. Nowhere in the Bible does God lay out an argument that says, here's why I exist. The Bible just assumes the existence of God. So the right question is not, is there a God? The right question becomes, who is God? That's the correct question. Who is God? Or in the spirit of the old game show, will the one true God please stand up? It is also fascinating to me as I study the scripture that God does not deny the existence of other gods. Did you know that? God does not deny the existence of other gods or at least other gods as we see it from our perspective. See, from our perspective, anything that is more powerful than us can be considered a god to us. As a matter of fact, there is an estimated 4,200 religions currently in the world, which means we have essentially concocted 4,200 potential gods. Will the right one, will the true one please stand up? But here's something else you need to understand about the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible says, declares, that he is a jealous God. What does that mean? Well, the first of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 and 4 says, You shall have no other gods before me, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Here's the summary. You must declare he won't share. You must declare he won't share. So this leads us to our key idea that we invited you to memorize this week. And I'm going to invite you to say it out loud with me. Who is God? I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God. So we've seen so far that the evidence that God, a God exists, is given to us in creation. Creation proves that there is a God. Now listen to this. Creation proves that there is a God, but how do we know who the one true God is? Now lean in. When you study the scriptures, the Bible does not produce an intellectual argument for you to consider, but rather an experiential encounter with God. You hear that? It's not so much an intellectual argument. I mean, they exist. The ontological argument, the theological argument, the cosmological argument. We could talk about those. Those are all neat and fancy. But in the scriptures, the proof that the God of the Bible is the one true God comes about through an experiential encounter. So write this down. The God's proof is in his promises kept and his power unleashed. God's proof that he is the one true God comes about because he keeps his promises and he unleashes his power. Let me give you three examples. The first one is found in Joshua chapter 24 or on page 18 of your Believe book. Joshua has courageously led the children of Israel in their relationship with God through his entire leadership tenure. Now he is old and he's about to die. And just like Moses felt, he felt like once he passed away, Israel would hedge on their commitment to God and stray away from God. Him. And so he gathers them all together at the end of his life, and he gives them this sort of George Patton-like stirring speech. So I want you to look on page 18, and let's uh, go uh, kind of toward the top, if you will. So Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. So he goes on after this little introduction to give the history of their story as a nation. And he begins where it all began with a character by the name of Abraham. 
Now, you may not know this, but Abraham was not raised in a Christian home. He was, in fact, raised in the area called Ur, and his father, Terah, actually worshipped many gods. The main god that they worshipped then was a god called Nana, or the moon god. You see, the moon is more powerful than us. If you've ever seen the full moon when it is closest to the earth, it's this gargantuan ball of light that looks like if it dropped on us, it would squish us like a bug. It is magnanimous. We don't have the same perspective as the ancient people did because of light pollution, but even today, it's still overwhelming. Listen to this. The lunar force and the gravitational pull of the moon affects large bodies of oceans, affecting their tide. Let me ask you a question. If the moon has that kind of pull and influence on the large bodies of the ocean, do you think the moon has any pull or influence on our little frames? The answer is yes. As a matter of fact, the the word lunatic comes from the belief that the moon causes intermittent insanity. Turn to your neighbor and say, that explains a lot. (laughs) This is where we also get the myth of the werewolf and the myth, maybe it's not a myth, that when it's a full moon, there is an outbreak of romantic love. The power of the moon. Later, when they are in Egypt in slavery, Joshua says, God rescued you. God rescued you. And because he rescued you, you should declare that he is the one true God. He unleashed the 10 plagues upon the Egyptians and the mighty Pharaoh. And not only that, but he parted the Red Sea through his power and he led you through the Red Sea onto the other side. And when Pharaoh, who thought of himself as a god, as the sun god, and his warriors were in the basin of the water, he caused the waters to collapse on them and they died. Over and over again in the Old Testament, when we hear this story, God says, I unleashed my mighty power against the Egyptians who were bullying you so that everyone, not just you, Israel, but everyone would be able to know that I, in fact, am the one true God because I am stronger than all of them and there's no one like me. Joshua then finishes up by recalling how God gave them the land of Canaan. God gave them the land of Canaan. He promised the land to uh, Abraham back in 2100 BC, and now around 1395 BC, he actually keeps his promise and gives them the land. And he not only gives them the land, but the way he does it is that he fights the battles for them, proving that he is the one true God. Remember the first battle of Jericho? The children of Israel barely lifted a finger. All they had to do was walk seven times around the city, and God unleashed his mighty power on the walls of Jericho, they fell down and the Israelites took possession. He kept his promise and gave him the land by unleashing his mighty power over the gods of the Canaanites and the Amorites who possessed the land. On this basis that God kept his promise to Israel and unleashed his power, Joshua offers them this mighty challenge. Maybe you've heard it before. It's on page 19 in bold type. This is how he wraps it up. He says, now... Fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors, your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. He says, you have to choose for yourself. God gives you the freedom to choose, but keep in mind, you must declare he will not share. You cannot choose a bunch. You can only choose one. 
In the next paragraph, the people said, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua says, not too fast, my friends. Remember, he is a jealous God. But they insist, no, this is our final answer. So you see this pattern in the scriptures where God proves that he is the one true God. He proves it by keeping his promises and by unleashing his power. Let me show you that pattern repeating itself again in 1 Kings chapter 18 or on page 20 of your Believe book. Fast forward 500 years from the life of Joshua. The children of Israel are now in the land of Canaan and we're going to see ourselves an old-fashioned showdown. Let me explain. Israel clearly did not keep their promise to follow God, proving that humans do not make good candidates for deity. In the region of Canaan, the land that they took possession of by the mighty hand of God, the Canaanites worshipped a god called Baal. We'll just call him Baal. Baal was the name of the local deity who owned that entire region and was responsible for the fertility of the land and for rainfall. And because most of the people living at that time were agrarian, they were farmers and shepherds, they really didn't want to tick off Baal because they needed the rain and the fertility of the land to be successful. Okay? So, because Israel did not obey the Lord when they entered into the land of Canaan under Joshua, they did not obey the Lord by wiping out the Canaanites and the Amorites, but left them in the land. Over time, the Israelites began to intermarry with the Canaanites. And what ended up happening over time, they began to intermingle their worship of Yahweh, the name of God of the Bible in the Old Testament, with the God of Baal or Baal. Now, fast forward in 1 Kings chapter 18, a foreign princess by the name of Jezebel marries the king of Israel at the time, a guy named King Ahab, and Jezebel declares it's time for us to obliterate Yahweh worship. God says, game on. Elijah picks a fight. He goes to the 450 prophets of Baal and he says, we're going to eliminate or obliterate Baal worship. How does he do it? Does he do it by intellectual arguments? No, he does it by a showdown of power. And they agree that the winner of this showdown will be declared the one true God. That's how back then they declared who was the one true God, the one who was the most powerful. So Elijah issues a challenge to the 450 prophets of Baal. He says, meet me out back at Mount Carmel. And here's what we're going to do. You're going to take a cow, a bull, and you're going to cut it up into pieces, ribeyes, fillets, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to stick it on an altar. And then you're going to call upon the God of Baal to burn this offering with fire. And we're going to give you the first shot at it. So I want you to turn to page 21 of your Believe book and see how it all came down for the prophets of Baal. I love the way, I love the way this reads. Okay, uh, about a, a third of the way down from the page, it says, Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us! They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered them, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. I love this. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. <laughs> so they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Now it's Elijah's turn. Sacrifices the bull, cuts him up, puts him on a restored altar, and then before he calls upon the God of the Bible, 
he does something cool. He takes four large jars of water and pours it over the sacrifice, not just once, but three times to absolutely verify that this red meat is drenched. Then he calls upon the Lord. Look at the bottom of page 21 and the top of page 22, the bold type. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all of these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know, Lord, you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all of the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That's how it works. You see, creation gives evidence that a God exists, but God proves that he is the one true God by keeping his promises and by unleashing his power. So now we ask the question, what do you believe? What do you believe? Write this down. God proves, God's proof is in his promises kept and his power unleashed. What I wanna do is take you to one more example in the New Testament that hits home for you. It is Acts chapter 17 in the New Testament or page 26 on your Believe book. The Apostle Paul is one of the key leaders in the church, spreading the message of Jesus to the world in, and now he finds himself here in Athens, Greece. He enters the Areopagus a place where intellectuals gather together to discuss religion and philosophy. Eris, the name named after the place, is the god of thunder and war. The god of thunder and war. Remember, anything more powerful than us is considered a god to us. Now, in Texas, thunder never scared me. But in Kansas, well, now that's another thing. The thunder is pretty scary here. And the Ares, the god of thunder and war, uh, was uh, named, the place was named after. And Paul starts teaching in small groups to people who would listen about Jesus and the resurrection. That's important. So curious as they were, they invited Paul to speak to the whole group. So if you have your Believe book, uh, turn to page 26, or you can look on Acts chapter 17. At the bottom of the page, it says, Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So he says to them, you have all of these gods that you worship and you're wanting to make sure you cover all of them so you appease them so they don't pick on you. And so you're not sure you've got all of them so you have one to the unknown God. And he says, that unknown God is the one that you're missing. He turns out to be the one and only true God. He introduces them to Jesus. He introduces them to Jesus, and th these folks are absolutely amazed. And he has to give proof that Jesus is, in fact, the one true God. So how does he do it? I want you to look on the bottom of page 27, or Acts chapter 17, verse 31. It reads, he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So I ask you the question, what do you believe? God proved he was your God 
when he kept his promise to you by providing the way back to him through Jesus Christ. Do you get that? God made a promise to you at the very beginning that he would provide the way back to a relationship with God, and he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. So he made a promise, and he kept his promise. And the Bible says, whoever believes in him shall be saved and live with him forever and ever. But listen to this. God proved he was your God when he unleashed his power and raised Jesus from the dead. To determine whether or not the God of the Bible is the only true God, all you have to do is answer one question. Isn't that helpful? I mean, religion is so complicated, you don't even know where to begin. If you want to ask and answer the question, is Christianity and the God of the Bible the one true God, you only need to answer one question. I hope that helps you. And here's the question. Did God raise Jesus from the dead? Interesting, you don't have to believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is. You don't have to believe in six literal day creations. There's lots of options. You don't have to believe that Jonah was swallowed up by a big fish. I think he was. But you don't have to believe that to be a Christian. You only have to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. If in your mind and your heart you conclude he did not, then I invite you to pass on Christianity because this entire religion hinges on that single act. However, if you conclude that God did in fact raise Jesus from the dead on the third day, then I invite you to look no further because you have found the way, the truth, and the life. It says in Athens, some sneered, but some also believed because God gives all humanity the freedom to choose. If I were God, I would give you no choice. (laughs) But for some reason, in God's sovereignty, he gives you the freedom to choose. And so it's now time for you to declare. But I invite you to remember, you must declare, but he won't share. People all around us today really struggle with the notion or the idea that Jesus is the only way to God. I'm just telling you, you may not like that idea, but it is what the Bible teaches. He is the only way. You cannot believe that there are multiple ways. There is one way, and his name is Jesus. You must declare because he will not share. And if you believe this, what difference will it make in your life? When the fiercest of storms break out in your life, when the darkness sets in over you and gives you great cause to be truly frightened, You will not be afraid. You will not be anxious because you know the one true God who loves you has kept his promise to you and makes available to you the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that he is in fact greater than all of these other things in your life. And you can rest and you can sleep peacefully because you have believed and declared this phrase. Say it with me if you know it. I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now say it by yourself. Ready? Out loud so everyone online can hear you. Ready? I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now stand to your feet and we're going to declare it like Joshua and like Elijah and like Paul wants us to declare it. Ready? I mean, let's raise the roof on this place. Ready? I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, we thank you so much for this truth. We know that you are the one true God. You have made a promise to us. You have kept it, and you have demonstrated your power through raising Jesus from the dead. That power is available to us as we leave this place and face the week. And so, Father, we declare it with all of our heart. You are the one true God, and all of God's people shouted, Amen. Amen.